Here we have uh, chapter 13. Chapter 13 looks at another or a few more cases of market failure. We've seen markets fail with government involvement in terms of price controls and in taxes. Where in price controls, uh, there's almost never any positive result from that market failure. At least with taxes, there will be a deadweight loss. However, it is a way for the government to raise money to provide goods and services that may not be provided any other way. So it may be, it may be a, a tr there's a trade-off there, and the question is whether the money raised by the government is worth more than the deadweight loss. So there's a positive uh, effect with, with uh, taxes. Another way for the market to fail is through uh, monopolies or monopoly power. And we saw a deadweight loss there is when the output is reduced and the price is increased. And now we have another way for the market to fail, and that's with externalities and public goods. And the first one we're going to look at are going to be externalities, which can cause a market failure on two different ways. And so first of all, the term externalities uh, can be either negative or positive. Negative externalities, also known as external or spillover cost. These are costs that are paid and cured by entities who were not party to the activity that generated the cost. So these are third-party effects. Positive externalities are also known as spillover external benefits, or benefits received by entities who were not party to the activity that, gener that generated the benefits. So again, these are people who got benefits for doing nothing, and then external costs are people who had to pay a cost for essentially doing nothing. So externalities will lead to the equilibrium output to be different than the optimal output. And that's the problem. We get equilibrium, which is now not optimal anymore. Before, we had equilibrium that would give us optimal if the market was competitive and there's no uh, government involvement. But now, uh, even with no government involvement, equilibrium can be not the same as the optimal output. So first look at negative externalities. An example of a negative externality would be, say, people living down the river from some polluting source, maybe a paper mill. A paper, paper mill is a pretty nasty uh, uh, facilities. They dump a lot of uh, waste products into the river, uh, foamy, smelly, not nice. And that flows down the river to people who did not produce the paper or even bought the paper, and yet they're paying a fair amount of cost from that pollution. So one of the best examples of negative externalities would be pollution. Uh, noise pollution, air pollution, water pollution, tr dumping the trash uh, uh, on the side of the road, all that, will, all those would be examples of negative externalities. Got a picture here, I'm not sure how it came out in terms of uh, being printed on paper, but I show this to my face-to-face -face classes and I don't tell them uh, what time of day it is, but this is a picture of Pittsburgh in the 1930s, I believe. Oh, I'm sorry. 1918. And the question is, what time of day is it in 1918 in Pittsburgh, downtown Pittsburgh, with all the lights on? And the answer is 10 a.m. Why are the lights on? Why is the dark so the sky so dark? Well, that's due to a lot of pollution from the steel mills at that time. Pittsburgh uh, was a main steel producing uh, area. And uh, that was all the negative externalities being thrown into the air, all the soot, and just terrible living conditions. And that's an example of the, and this is uh, an example of the free market causing the market failure. It's not government causing it, it's the free market itself. It's simply competition among all the producers who are trying to lower the cost. And we've talked about the fact that uh, competition is good to keep your cost under control. Um, how, um, how it also urges uh, manufacturers to cut corners and dump their waste products into the river or into the air, uh, maybe uh, kind of um, cheat on the quality of the material. Uh, sometimes manufacture automobiles that are not as safe as they should be because it's cheaper. All those can create negative externalities. So let's look at the model for uh, externalities, uh, negative externalities. 
And we have to we have to use uh, here that we've sort of talked about before. First, we have the marginal social cost, and that's the additional cost paid by society for one more unit of production. I like to call this the true cost. So this is the true cost, the total cost of producing one more unit of output, one more uh, ream of paper, one more ton of steel. And then we have the marginal private cost. And up to now, the marginal private cost and the marginal social cost were the same things. Now we're going to introduce a concept where they are not the same thing. So marginal private cost is the regular marginal cost we've been talking about for firms. The additional cost paid by the producer for one more unit of production. The cost paid by the manufacturer. And now we have a new concept, marginal external costs. These are the costs that are paid not by the manufacturer, but they're imposed on a third party. So if my example of the paper mill, these would be the people living down the river from the manufacturer of paper. They're either drinking dirty water, uh, smelly water, or they have to pay a fair amount of money to filter the water out to make it drinkable. And so now your marginal social cost is the total cost, and it's made up of the cost paid by the manufacturers plus the third party cost. Now, if we have marginal external cost being zero, meaning there is no marginal external cost, then there's no problem. Then, marginal social cost is the marginal private cost, and then the equilibrium output is the same as the optimal. But if there are marginal social costs, then we're going to overproduce, and then the equilibrium output is going to be greater than the optimal. So down here, we have a supply and demand graph. We have the regular demand. Now, if we have external benefits, then that's going to affect the demand side of the market. So we're going to assume there are no external benefits when we look at external cost. We're going to look at one, one kind of externality at a time. We're not, we're not going to combine both because that would that, be just crazy. Even though know, what happens in reality, it's really hard to model that in terms of say, a, a class that's a principles class. So now we have the firm's marginal cost. And that is, those are the costs paid by the firm. And so when the firm manufactures this product, say it's paper, these are the additional costs to making each amount of paper, a ream of paper, a ton of paper, a box of paper, whatever unit you want. Unfortunately, there's also external costs imposed on society, and that represents the vertical distance between the so our society's marginal cost, which is our marginal social cost, and the firm's marginal cost, which is our marginal private cost. And this is the supply, because the supply only recognizes, or I should say the market only recognizes the cost paid by the manufacturer. They're the ones who are selling the paper. Their costs are the ones that matter for the market. The additional cost imposed on, other, on third parties, since they're not selling the paper, the market doesn't really care about them. And so then the vertical distance between these two lines will be the amount of the external cost right there. That is our external cost. That would be our marginal external cost. And because I drew the two lines parallel, uh, the marginal social cost and the marginal private cost, we are saying that the marginal external cost is constant for every unit of output produced, which doesn't have to be true, but it's easier to draw it that way. And so the vertical distance between these two lines here are going to be your marginal external cost. Now what does that do? Well, here is going to be equilibrium. So price P1 and output Q1 is going to be the equilibrium price and output because that's what the market recognizes the manufacturer's cost. However, the true cost to society is up here. So what has happened is that we are producing this amount of paper from Q star to Q1 amount that cost us more than it's worth. This is the optimal output. There's equilibrium. Q1 is equilibrium, Q star is optimal. That's where the marginal social cost and the marginal utility, there's a marginal utility there, and the marginal social cost equal. The problem going past point B is now the costs are up here. That's the additional cost up there. 
I'll circle that, say with a red circle. And then the cost down here, I'm sorry, the benefits down here, that is benefit we get from that paper. Let me circle that with a blue pen. And so we go past point B, we're producing paper that has a higher cost than benefit. And that will create a daily loss, which is what I'll do when I come back. I'll talk about the daily loss for part two.